Let's bow our heads and pray, and we'll ask the Lord to bless this time that we have together in the Word of God today. Oh, Father in heaven, we come before you as a people who stand in desperate need of your intervening grace. Lord, we live in a difficult day. We live in difficult circumstances. We live with a million temptations to, to fear, to, to let ourselves be overcome by the things around us which uh, threaten us on every side. So we ask today that as we look to your word that you would give us your strength and your peace and in the midst of even a necessity for, for caution to yet have a bold uh, faith that stands tall uh, for the Lord. And so I pray that you would use your word by the work of your Holy Spirit to do that in our hearts today. Give me the words to say that would communicate this uh, text very clearly and that there would be nothing that would be said which would distract from what you have for us today. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us hearts to understand. Strengthen every Christian in their faith and draw the unbeliever unto the Lord to be saved today. We commit this unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 46 has been a faithful friend to me over many years of ministry. Um, it has been kind of, uh, you know, when you, when you do renovations in your house, when you have the projects that you're working on, there are certain tools that you get out every once in a while. But then there are other tools that for everybody that, that does anything with their hands, any, or even arts and crafts, there are certain tools that you are taking out every single time, right? Every single project, there are certain things that you can depend on that you are going to be using. And Psalm 46 has been kind of that Swiss Army knife of texts for me. And uh, whether it be somebody that's in the hospital uh, certainly when uh, somebody is facing uh, their final hours before they launch out into eternity, Psalm 46 has been that kind of a friend to me. The inscription of the psalm, and you know, we, and I've said this to you before, but you know, as we, as we look at this psalm in our English translations, um, we look at the verse numberings, and verse number one starts off with God is our refuge and strength. Actually, in the Hebrew, that is verse two. So most psalms have what we would call an inscription, and the inscription here says to the chief musician, a psalm of, this, of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamoth, and that in the Hebrew text is verse one. And uh, so we call it an inscription, they called it verse one. Uh, the inscription here says that it is a song for Alamoth that probably refers to the tune when they would sing these psalms that that probably refers to the tune that it would have been sung to. So let's read this psalm here. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The, he the, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who hath made desolations in the earth. 
He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let me ask for a little a informal poll here this morning. We won't be counting votes, by the way. We don't want to get into that confusion. But how many of us in this room, how many of you really enjoy roller coasters? Raise your hands. You really enjoy roller coasters. All right, my hand is up on that one. How many of you say, no time for those anymore. My, I, I'm really not interested in roller coasters anymore. Are you kidding? Okay, yeah, all right. I was going to say, hold on now. Some of you have spoken to me about this. I know some of you are not interested in roller coasters anymore. You know, a roller coaster is designed... Uh, to put you through experiences that, what do they do? They fool your body into thinking that you are in imminent deathly peril, right? That's what a good roller coaster does. When you're on that ride and you're being jerked around, you're going up and down, your heart races, your adrenaline starts pumping, uh, and, the, and your, your pupils dilate, right? What are these? These are visceral responses that God has created in your body that uh, the, your body responds in these ways when it is preparing for emergency. All right? Your body is preparing for some imminent emergency of peril that you need to respond to. Blood is rushing to your large muscles in case you need to flee. Uh, your pupils dilate in order to take in uh, as much of a field of vision as possible. Your body is preparing for emergency. Now, some people get off of that roller coaster and they say, I am never getting on a contraption like that again in my life. Very, very logical response uh, to being on a roller coaster. Others embrace the notion of the thrill of the roller coaster. The, the, uh, they, they say, okay, I just remind myself that I'm not going to die when I'm on this ride. This ride will not be my demise. And on that basis, the person can uh, funnel the panic responses into instead enjoying Right? They can enjoy the thrill. They can enjoy the adrenaline. And uh, how is it that a person embraces that notion? They say, okay, I am here. And I, I have confidence in the designers of this, uh, of this ride. I have confidence in the people that maintain it. I have confidence in the staff that is at this park. And that's why, I mean, like Six Flags, all the, uh, I'm all in. I will go on almost every ride. Now, when we go down to the Westport Fair, I'm not so, I'm not so thrilled with that, all right? So, you know, I see these things and I say, you know what, these things, I mean, we set up a table at the fair every year, and I know they put these things up overnight, okay? So uh, my confidence is not that high. Sorry, kids, I know you guys get your tickets and you go all day, but we sit at our table and we, we give out little sun catcher crafts. That's what we do, all right? So, uh, so anyways, I have confidence in this team, and, and so therefore I can enjoy the ride. And as the roller coaster comes back in the home base, you know, when you're standing in line and, uh, and you watch the roller coaster come back into home base, you see the range of emotion on people's faces, right? You can see the abject terror on the faces of some. You can see just extreme giddiness in others. Same experience, right? They all went through the exact same twists and turns and ups and downs, but polar opposites as far as responses. Now, physiologically, their bodies all had similar physiological responses, but their, their response to those responses was vastly different. Now, I say I set the stage for where we're going here. 2020 has been a wild ride, hasn't it? 
it has been a wild ride. And it's not over yet. It, we still got some. We still got some days to go. I mean, none of us uh, on a New Year's Eve party, uh, none of us would have cheered and given out hugs and kisses uh, on uh, as we welcomed uh, 2020 in, had we known what it had in store for us. Right. Psalm 46 is the word of the Lord to us in the midst of a wild ride. Psalm 46 has three sections to it, and each of those sections are delineated by that word uh, that you might, as we read the psalm, you might have seen, you see it three times, verse, uh, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 11, the word selah. You come across that word in your Bible reading, you scratch your head and you say, what in the world does that mean? Uh, it is, the word selah comes from the Hebrew word, get ready for this, selah. All right? That's the Hebrew word. We just put it right in, just spelled it right out in, in, our, in our English letters. It comes from the Hebrew word pronounced the same way, selah. And it just means to pause. It means slow down. Contemplate. In fact, sometimes when I publicly read, uh, when I read uh, one of the Psalms and the word Selah is in there, sometimes instead of actually reading the word, I'll just perform that instruction and just pause there for a minute. And people say, oh, Pastor, why didn't you read the word Selah? Well, I did what it said to do. So that's what it means. It means slow down, pause, contemplate. What has just been said is significant. Uh, Martin Luther, as I said, took the inspiration that for the song that we just sang. We hadn't sung that song in a long time. And I said, well, we've got to sing that song this morning. He took his inspiration for that hymn, uh, the, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That was the battle hymn of the Protestant Reformation in the early 1700s. But he took, it from, he took his inspiration for that song from Psalm 46. This psalm seems to have been written at some time of crisis. And so today we live in some experience of crisis. We live our lives today seemingly on razor's edge. And Psalm 46 reminds us that our safety in crisis is from God and God alone. Yes, this world is on fire. This world's on fire. Yes, things are falling apart around us. True, things are tumultuous around us, but understand, let's remind ourselves that we have read what the scriptures say about days which will come, and this world is destined to fall apart. This world is all heading that direction anyways. We who have come to Christ those of you who have proclaimed Jesus Christ to be your Savior, He has saved you from your sins. He is your Lord and Master. Um, we have proclaimed Him to be our only hope, the only hope of salvation of our souls in eternity. We have to remember to as much as we trust the Lord with what is yet to come, we've got to trust Him with today. We've got to trust Him with what is on this side of the valley of the shadow of death. And in many cases, it is much easier for us to trust God with what happens after death than it is for us to trust God with the here and now of the windshield view of my life of what I'm going through today. Just like that person being jerked around and going upside down on the roller coaster just reminds himself, reminds herself, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm not going to die. Uh, the people that designed this ride, the people that built this ride, it's been standing for a long time now. No one has died yet. I will be okay. We need to remind ourselves in times like today of God's providence of God's leadership, of God's sovereignty, that all of these things that we are going through are sent to teach us to rest in Him. They are sent to us. They're not just sent to us on a global level. They are sent to you and to me individually to teach me to trust God more, to thrust me to know God more, and for you as well. 
everything is going to be okay. We need to take a breath. We need to just calm down. We need to chill out. Everybody is so bothered, perpetually bothered these days. Everybody is so irritated constantly. Everybody is perpetually angry about something. As believers, let's calm down. Let us shine, let this testimony shine from our lives that in the midst of all of the tumult, in the midst of all of the confusion, God is not confused. God is not worried. The brow of the Almighty has no wrinkles of worry upon it. God is in control. Let's just calm down. Everything is going to be okay because of the first two words of this psalm, God is. God is. And so I want to look at a few things this morning from this psalm and uh, just try to divide this psalm up into a few different sections to see some things about who God is that gives us peace in the time of storm, that gives us security, that gives us confidence in difficult days. Number one, God is dependable. We see that in verses one through three. God is dependable. He is for us. We see a vivid picture of this in verse 2. He says, uh, Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. The earth and the mountains are pictures of those things which are solid, those things which are dependable, those things that in our estimation we would say these things are not going to move, these things are not going to change. Now, the sea on the op in, in the opposite way, it's tumultuous. The sea is always moving. The sea is always chaos. It is ebbing. It is flowing. You don't know what you're going to get when you go out onto the sea. And the psalmist here says, we will not fear. Be even when the, when the earth and the mountains, those things which are dependable, those things which are always the same, supposedly, are being cast into the sea of chaos and confusion. You know, we live in a day when suddenly the things that we uh, have taken for granted all our lives as always being the same, as always being dependable. We always have done this. We always have done that. It seems that these things are slipping and sliding into the chaos of undependability instability, churning, and chaos. Things, friends, institutions, things that we figured would always be the same. These are things in life that you and I, we lean hard upon. And then at some point, those things that we are leaning heavy on, they get kicked out from underneath us and we fall hard. We thought they would always be there. Suddenly things that you thought would be stable have failed you. Family, friends, jobs, institutions. We make our plans for the future and uh, we just assume that they're going to be there. We, like many of you, we planned a, uh, an, an elaborate vacation for May of 2020. And we were going uh, we to go out west and, and, and uh, go out to, uh, to Utah and do some exploring at the national parks out there. We just assume that you make those plans and you're always going to be able to do it. And all of a sudden things that you have always assumed to be dependable are not dependable at all anymore. Sometimes God takes these things that we lean on, he takes them away. So we'll just, we'll see how hard we were leaning on them. But in contrast to all of that, the Bible tells us here that God is absolutely dependable. God is absolutely dependable. Romans chapter 8 tells us that nothing can separate the believer from the love of God. And the chapter goes through uh, things from A to Z. It says whether it is height or whether it is depth, whether it is death, whether it is life, whatever it is, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all of the 
uh, in all of the, the, the instability, God is with us. He's with us as a refuge, it says, a place of safety. In the sinking sands of instability, God is a never failing refuge. He is with us not only as a refuge, it says, He is also our strength. The refuge is the idea of defense. But if the refuge is defense, then God being our strength is the offense. His presence is with us, not just as a passive existence, but an active, empowering existence. Empowering you, empowering me to face whatever crisis God sends our way because it is within His purposes. He is our refuge. He is our strength. Then what does it say? He is with us as a help. Literally, the verse says, in trouble, God is abundantly found. Your translation might say, a, a present help in time of trouble. In trouble, God is abundantly present. In the time of trouble, God will make himself known to you. That's the idea. In every situation, God reveals something of himself to us. The old hymn, I ran out of, uh, of time to, uh, to, to continue to sing old hymns this morning uh, because so many of them are so pertinent to this subject. Oh God, our help in ages past. Our, hell, our hope in ages past. Our hope for years to come. Uh, God makes himself available to us. God isn't playing hide and seek with us. God isn't, uh, God, isn't sheltered, God isn't getting away from you. Everything that we once considered to be stable now shows itself to be unstable, slipping into chaos. But here is one thing that has never changed. God is with us. And the psalmist says at the end of verse 3, Selah, stop. Slow down. Don't just rush to the next verse. Stop and think on this. Stop and meditate upon this. In all of the shifting stands of, sands of instability, God is dependable. It's not changed. Number two, in verses four through seven, we see that God is present. First of all, he is uh, dependable. He's, he is for us. Secondly, God is present. He is with us. What, uh, what is it that will give you consolation in times of crisis? What is it that is going to give you true comfort in times of turmoil? It is this truth that was, uh, that was manifested uh, very evidently in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us. This is our joy. This is our security. Verse 4 speaks of a river that, uh, whose streams make glad the city of God. And understand something. This is not a physical river that he is talking about. There was no such river in Israel that the psalmist would have been describing. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. God will help her. So what is that river? It is the presence of God. This gladness doesn't mean that we are, this is that the presence of God, this river is going to make us glad. It doesn't mean that we are going to be giddy when times are tough. What it does mean is that in the toughest of circumstances, that the believer, because of the presence of God, would be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I have learned in whatever state I am in, Philippians chapter 4, to be content. I've learned. It's not something that comes naturally. It is a spiritual discipline. It is reminding myself of the truth of God's word on the basis of what God has said. I can be content despite circumstances. David said in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the deep darkness of the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear evil. I don't fear that I'm going to be ultimately harmed. Why? Because God is with me. 
The presence of God is that. It is refreshing. It is an ever-flowing, refreshing river that brings joy, brings gladness, brings contentment into our hearts. You see, God is, theologically we use the word, God is transcendent. That means God is high and lifted up, high above his creation. But in his transcendence, God condescends to us. Almost like that uh, a parent who is stooping down to the level of the toddler to make himself or herself accessible to this child. God in his transcendence condescends to us. God is present with us. It says the Lord of hosts is with us. And that, uh, that, that Martin Luther quoted that in the song we sang, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And he said that God is with us and it said, the Lord of Sabaoth is his name. And you say, Sabaoth, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me tell you, the Lord, it says the Lord of hosts is with us. Lord, the word Lord here is probably in your, in your uh, translation in all capital letters. And so that signifies the Hebrew word Jehovah, the covenant name of God that he has bound himself by his grace to every believer. God has covenanted himself to you. But then it says he is the Lord of hosts. What is a host? Uh, Luther referred to it as Sabaoth. That is the Hebrew word is the Lord of armies. The Lord of armies. That speaks of his power. That God is with us. God has bound himself to us. But he does so as a Lord who uh, employs all of his might on our behalf. God is ready to act for us. God is ready to act in grace toward us. Because it says then, the God of Jacob is our refuge. God of Jacob? I mean, yeah, I mean, he's the God of Abraham, faithful Abraham, the God of Isaac, the son of Abraham, right? But Jacob, he wasn't exactly the most savory of characters, especially in his early years, was he? In fact, he spent most of his life as a deceiver. He spent most of his life as someone that, you know, you could not turn your back on that guy because he will, uh, he will swindle you in one way or the other. God intervened in his life by grace. God saved him and God changed him. So when it says the God of Jacob is our refuge, it speaks of God's overwhelming grace that overcomes all of our weaknesses, overcomes all of our flaws. All of us are works in progress. God is with us. He is employing his might on our behalf, but his might is especially devoted to changing us us from the inside out. The God of Jacob, the God of grace is with us. Then verse 5, it says that God shall help her just at the break of dawn. And the idea here is that God intervenes in our situation at just the right time. God intervenes in our situation with perfect timing. He wastes no time. He helps us at the very best time. I was just talking to a pastor, a friend of mine, uh, a couple of days ago, and we were reminiscing about a meeting that about seven or eight pastors and I had together uh, way back in March when all of this tumult began. And uh, I said, okay, we need to all get together. We need to talk. We need to have a round table of what each of us has for ideas for how to deal with this situation. And so we all got here and put our heads together because I said, I am not smart enough for this. I need to uh, have, a, uh, have some help from guys who are smarter than me. And they all thought they were going to get help from me. I thought I was going to help from them and nothing happened. But he said, Jared, don't you remember when we met at your church back in March and we were talking about this and we were like, can you imagine if this goes to like Easter? <laughs> Wouldn't that be so horrible if we still have to have our having to deal with this situation in like mid-April? 
Oh, no, no, it's not going to happen, right? It's going to be way past my April. And here we are in November. And almost, we're knocking on the door of December. And we've still got these things that we have to concern ourselves with. You know what? God's timing is not our timing. We think we know what's best. We think we know what God should do. And we want to impose our wills on him. And we say, God, you need to change my situation. And I want you to do it right now. And then we get irritated and impatient with God when he doesn't do things the way we think he should. You know, God doesn't always answer our prayers like we think he should. If every prayer that I ever prayed was answered just the way I thought it should be answered, my life would be a disaster. Because I don't know what's best. But God does know what's best. And this verse tells me that God is going to help us at the break of dawn. God will waste no time. God will act at the perfect time in his purpose and in his plan. Verse 1 said that he is a help. Help, the fact of who he is, he is a help. Now in verse 5 determines what he does. Since he is a help, what does he do? He helps. He is a helper at just the right time. And again, the psalmist says at the end of verse 11, excuse me, at the end of verse 7, Selah, stop. Slow down. Don't rush beyond this. Meditate upon this truth that God is present. He is with us. In verses 8 through 11, we see that God is able. God is over us. The command of verse 8 is to draw near. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Look on this. Consider this. You know, troubles are a part of God's plan. God's, uh, God brings troubles our way. God also brings deliverance our way. And the command is here to come and behold. Have a, it's not just saying look at something, but in a thoughtful, faith-filled way, look at what God is doing. It implies a look of faith, a look of dependence. And as I said last Sunday, it is faith that gives us the ability to see what truly is beyond what appears around us. Our eyes fool us. You know, they say, I used to have a coworker that always tell me, Jared, you can only believe a half of what you hear and maybe, maybe a little bit more of that of what you can see. Our eyes fool us. You can't believe everything you see, but you can put your feet down on everything that this word says. We sang the song this morning, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness on Christ, the solid rock I stand. God has never failed us. God never will fail us. Are we, uh, you know, are, are, do we have troublesome days ahead of us? Yes, we do. I mean, this situation may be getting better soon. I hope, I pray it does. But you know what? As soon as this situation is over, there are going to be other days of trouble ahead of us. For your family, for this church, for us as individuals, difficult days will come but God will never fail us. God is able. God is over us. Trust in the Lord is not make-believe. Trust in the Lord is not a, just a pasted-on superficial grin that refuses to think deeply about things. People have this misconception that a Christian is somebody that just puts on a fake smile and just says, oh, I'm just trusting the Lord anyways, and they just refuse to think about things. No, that is not what true faith is about. Faith is not blind. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a leap into the glorious light of what God has said. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that no difficulty will befall us, but such as God is able to deliver us. God is able. You know, people say, well, God is never going to put you in circumstances greater than you can bear. Search the Bible, and you will not find that in this book. You will not find it. It's not true. 
God is going to put you in circumstances greater than you can bear. But he will not put you in circumstances greater than he can help you through. God puts us in situations that are bigger than our capacity to cope within ourselves so that we finally admit our own weakness. Admit our own inability to cope with things by our own strength so that we will finally rest in him as we must. The Bible says that even though we can't handle things on our own, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Look at what he does to the troubles of life. Verse 9 says he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He gives, uh, he gives quiet. He gives a, a quiet of true peace. You know, the, the best quiet that I can impose on a situation is the ceasefire that only gives both parties a chance to reload. That's the only quiet that I can impose on a situation. But what does God do? He makes the wars to cease. It says he, he breaks the bow and he cuts the spear into it. He burns the chariot. Here are great human powers, the greatest of human powers for the psalmist. But beyond it all, God is going to do what God purposes to do. God is not seated on heavenly bleachers as a spectator. God's not. God is not sitting in heaven uh, cheering you on when you do well and booing you when you do badly. You know, you sit in the stands at your kids' games and you get frustrated. Oh, I wish this kid would do better. I wish the refs would do better. I wish the coach would do better. And uh, my kid would be a, a superstar athlete if it wasn't for all these other things, right? When we sit on the bleachers, that's the best we can do. God isn't on the bleachers in heaven. God is on his throne in heaven. And he is ruling. He is mandating. He is purposing. And what God has purposed will come to pass. Not on the bleachers. He is on the throne. And he will act for his glory, which is our ultimate good. We know, according to God's word, how this world is going to play out. There is a certainty for the future of this age. But here is comfort, not only for the day which is to come. Here is comfort for today. So the psalmist once again says, Selah, stop, slow down, meditate on this, consider this, dear believer. Just relax. Just calm down. Settle down. Everything is on God's course for the accomplishing of His purpose and for His glory. Don't get so wrapped up. Don't get so agitated by what you see around you. Look beyond to the eternal realities by faith. And what's the result here? Verse 2. We go back, uh, take one more pass through here, and we see the results. Verse 2, he says, we will not fear. We will not fear. In, omit, in the midst of a world with everything falling apart, we hold on to these truths. God is with us. God is for us. God is over us. And therefore, we will not fear. Do you know, fear not is the most repeated command in all of Scripture. The most repeated command, fear not. And you know, with all of the times that the Lord tells us in the Word to not fear, you will not find one time where He says, don't fear because there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, we tell our kids that. We say there's nothing to be afraid of, therefore don't fear. God says to us, in the midst of a world that is filled with things to be afraid of, my child, don't fear. That's an act of faith. Don't fear. What we fear determines how we behave. Fear is that which paralyzes us. Uh, you know, if you, are, if you are hiking in the woods... And let's say you're in an area of the uh, area of the country that has venomous snakes. 
you're hiking in the woods and you see that snake that has that little funny little rattling thing on the end of his tail and that uh, thing is rattling what is your instinct your first response your body is probably going to respond by just freezing right you freeze God has made, you know, we talk about, uh, we talk about uh, fight or flight, but actually the first instinct most of the time is freeze. Try to say, okay, if I don't move, this snake will not know I'm here, right? Just don't move. We freeze. Fear paralyzes us. It's what a lion's roar does to, a, to the animal that it's about to. Why does a lion roar before it attacks? To paralyze its prey with fear. The devil, men and women, is a roaring lion, and he is seeking to paralyze you by fear. It is not that there's nothing to fear. There are plenty of things to fear. But God is bigger than all of these things. Therefore, in the midst of a world where we need to take due caution, yet with due caution, we can have the boldness of faith that says, my life is in God's hands, therefore I will not fear. What we fear determines our behavior. Today we are, we are being fed a steady diet of fear. Steady diets. And it's a bigger helping every single day. Fear of government, fear of sickness, fear of violence, fear of every single thing. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's pray that God gives us the honesty to look ourselves in the mirror and actually see what is there. Be honest with yourself. Have you gone anywhere spiritually this year? Why don't you ask, me, ask yourself that question? Have I gone anywhere spiritually this year? For some of you, this has been a tremendous year spiritually. You have grown in leaps and bounds. Praise God for that. There are many of us that, truth be told, we have been frozen in our tracks spiritually by the fear that the devil has brought our way. The truth is that we don't realize it very easily. But some of us in this room, and maybe if you, have, if you have somebody that loves you enough that would really tell you the truth about yourself, maybe you would have the boldness to go to that person and just ask them the question. Some of us in this room, you exude fear. It is just it is seeping out of every pore of your body and everybody in your sphere of influence feels it. Everybody in your sphere of influence has to treat you differently because you are just exuding fear. It ought not be the case with the believer. Again, I'm not talking about throwing off caution, but I'm saying in the midst of due caution, well, it's not fair. There's no need for it. The believer should exude the boldness of faith, which is the opposite of fear. We live as we look. And what I fasten my eyes on, what I fasten my attention upon, determines what I fear. And some of us have been so overwhelmed with physical health that we have completely neglected spiritual health. I, I don't want to get sick. I don't, want, I don't like getting sick. I'm terrible at being sick. I'm like most men. We're crybabies when we're sick. I don't like being sick. But worse than that, I don't want to be spiritually dead. And we ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to be more concerned with our spiritual health than we are with our physical health. We live as we look. What we fasten our attention on determines what we fear. And I need to turn from what are the apparent realities of this life to the greater spiritual realities. God is for us. God is with us. God is over us. And therefore, I can set out to do what God has called me to do with the boldness of faith. Verse 5 says she will not be moved. She will not be moved. There's chaos all around me, but God's presence is my stability. 
It talks about the... Uh, Still in verse, he talks about the kingdoms raging, the, the nations raging, the kingdoms being moved. Uh, these things are all flexing their muscles, but I have confidence in the truth of the Lord. He is for me, he is with me, and he is over me. Therefore, I'll not be moved. I'm not going to be helter-skelter. I'm not going to be scurrying around. I'm not going to be running around in a panic. I'm not going to be running around, we say proverbially, like a chicken with its head cut off. Sometimes these days I hear people talking about a head with a chicken cut off. I don't get that. You don't run around if you're a head with a chicken cut off. But how many of us have been scurrying around like a chicken with its head cut off, aimless, blind, and destined to fall? And when it does fall, it'll be for good. Don't fear. Don't be moved. Number, verse 10 climax of this psalm, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. The idea here of being still, the, the word actually has the idea of a physical relaxation. And the Hebrew word actually has the picture of a person who is all tense and now just, you know what it's like to... Uh, just relax. Almost like a slumping down of relaxation. Quiet your heart with these truths and you will be reminded that He is God. I will not fear. I will not be moved. I will just relax. Think about the uh, soldiers landing on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. Here they are those boats come up, to the, come up to the beach in a hail of gunfire that is all around them. And these soldiers got off of those boats marching into that hail of gunfire, many of them marching right into bullets, taking their lives. But they did so with the confidence that their cause, what they were called to do, they were giving their lives for what was just and right. And they had the assurance, therefore, that uh, they would not die in vain. Dear believer, you have the precious truths of God's word to assure you that you will not fail as your eyes are on the Lord. You have a greater confidence than any soldier marching onto a beach in Normandy. You have assurance that God is with you and you will not fail. He's with us. He is over us. He's for us. So just calm down. In the history of mankind, and for you men, especially of you who are younger in, in your married life, let me give you a, a pro tip here. In the history of mankind, telling somebody to calm down in the midst of an emotional outburst, telling them just calm down, it has never resulted in the person calming down. Never. It doesn't work. It is only, and that being said, that is only slightly more effective than, remember in the old movies, when someone would be completely uh, off their rocker, hysterical, and what would someone do? they come by and slap them in the face. Now, telling someone to calm down in the midst of an emotional outburst is slightly more effective than slapping them in the face. Slapping me in the face is not going to ever calm me down, that's for sure. But you know, the obvious thing to do, just looking at things around us, is to panic. But down through the corridors of time, God, exalted on his throne, calls us in this psalm to just calm down, to look to who he is. Sure, body and soul cry out to us to panic because these, because my body, everything in me is telling me that what I am going through is going to be for my undoing. And suicide rates right now are skyrocketing because people are looking around them and the hopelessness of what is going on around me calls for me to panic, calls for me to fear, and tells me there is no hope. But dear believer, let your faith in the good providence of God put a smile on your face as you go through this wild ride. Again, it's like that roller coaster. Two people 
with the same experience but diametrically opposite uh, emo uh, different responses to that. One is panicking. One says, I never want to step foot on that again. And the other says, I have confidence in the people that designed this. Therefore, I love it. I'm not telling you that we should embrace this and say, this is the best day of my life. No, this stinks. But yet, God is for us. God is with us. God is over us. And he has all of this in his hands. And therefore, even these hard things that we go through, we can enjoy them for what they are. Just calm down. Things are going to be okay. God hasn't abdicated his throne. Let's pray. Father, give us your help. We live in a world gone mad. We live in a day where there is so much to fear, where there is so much reason, humanly speaking, to panic. But we thank you that your word reminds us that you are with us, you are for us, and you are over us. Therefore, we will not fear. I pray that we would be still and that we would be reminded that you are God. These things which will not change. Lord, remind us and quiet our hearts before you. Strengthen us to face the challenges of the day. Lord, we always pray for deliverance. We know these things are in your hands. We beg of you that you would. But Lord, as, we, as you tarry that, as we wait, strengthen our hearts to calm down. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.